Kai. Welcome to another episode of Beyond the Paper Gown, where we consider factors both in and outside of the healthcare system that affect women's health and highlight what we can do to improve our own health. I'm Dr. Mitzi Crockover. So have you ever felt like your GI troubles were just shrugged off with, it's probably just stress? Or maybe you've been puzzled by how your digestive system seems to have a mind of its own, especially with the ebb and flow of hormonal changes. Well, you're definitely not alone. As a clinician, I've seen firsthand how GI issues can play a significant role in women's lives, often with unique challenges that are distinct from men's experiences. Bloating and gas may be nuisances, but they may also be a warning sign of something more serious. Complex conditions like irritable bowel syndrome or inflammatory bowel disease caused by autoimmune processes are more frequent in women, and even a seemingly GYN issue like endometriosis has a connection to the gut. The gut also directly communicates with our brain and nervous system, messing with our mood as well as causing GI symptoms, which we're only now beginning to learn about how to modify. And there's so much more. So today we are joined by an incredible expert, Dr. Jacqueline Wolf. Dr. Wolf brings years of expertise, research, and a profound understanding of how our guts work, and sometimes how they don't. She's on faculty at Harvard Medical School and on staff at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, and is the author of A Woman's Guide to a Healthy Stomach. You know, I'm so glad you're here to join us for a candid conversation about all things GI health. And I do mean candid. We're going to talk about all the things, including how to get rid of gas and constipation, even how often someone should poop. So consider yourself warned. But honestly, it's important information, and we're here to discuss it. Remember, this podcast is for informational purposes only, so do consult with your healthcare provider for personalized advice. I am delighted to have our guest today. Dr. Jacqueline Wolf is Associate Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School and in the Division of Gastroenterology at Beth Israel Dinkinus Medical Center. Her specialty is inflammatory bowel disease and women's gastrointestinal health. She's received numerous awards and honors. She's the author of over 60 articles, chapters, reviews, and editorials. And she also authored a book for the lay public entitled A Woman's Guide to a Healthy Stomach, Taking Control of Your Digestive Health. She's appeared on television, radio, and in the lay press. Dr. Jackie Wolf, it is so good to see you, albeit virtually, and have you today. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Oh, I tell you, you know, I have a kind of a funny story. Um, when I was doing my residency in internal medicine, um, at the end, the head of uh, GI and another attending, you know, motioned me over <laughs> during rounds and said, what do you think about a GI fellowship? And at the time I said, you know, it's my least favorite body fluids, <sighs> so I think I'll pass. And, you know, in retrospect, that was probably not a really bright thing because, again, did not understand at the time the breadth of what gastroenterology really covers and perhaps even most importantly, the differences between women and men. Right. And that, again, what they were really focused on is trying to get more women in. So, um, but I'm delighted that you didn't have that experience <laughs> in terms of turning away. So talk a little bit about why you did choose gastroenterology. Well, it's interesting because when I first started, sort of like you, uh, and I started before you, there were only a few women in gastroenterology. Right. And you'd go to a conference, there'd be one woman per three rows. And um, so it was unusual. So when I started, started and I was trying to decide on my internship and residency, everybody said, oh, of course you're going into OBGYN, you're a woman. And I go, no. And then they said, well, of course you're going into pediatrics, you're a woman. And I say, no. So, but, you know, what's interesting is the intersection between all of those things. So I went into gastroenterology, I did my um, 
residency at the University of Chicago, and then I actually short-tracked at that time and only did two years and went to Brigham and Women's Hospital. At that time, it was Peter Ben Brigham. Now it's Mass General Brigham, but it's still the same hospital. And I uh, did my fellowship, and I was the first woman to complete their fellowship there. Um, wow. The, and I did basic research for a long time, and then transitioned over to clinical. But I've always been interested in identifying something new. And you still heard in your office at that time, women saying that their symptoms were not taken seriously. Women weren't taken seriously. And unfortunately, that still happens. Um, True. But then I... I moved, um, I went across the street after a while, um, after many years, and I've done mostly clinical, and we've been developing a woman's digestive health center now. And so what is different between a woman's digestive system and a man's? So let's start from the beginning, and I am going (laughs) to back up for what you had said about why you didn't go into GI. (laughs) So clearly, um, all we thought about was like poop, nausea and vomiting, if that's the other thing we were going to do. And since then, I I will back up again. I did my original research on how viruses cross the GI tract and Hmm. interacted with the immune system. So since then, it's become interesting because, you know, it's from your mouth and your dental health and your microbiome all the way out. And so there are a lot of opportunities for being different. Um, At puberty, uh, women obviously get a lot of, um, they start getting their menstrual cycle with changes in estrogen and progesterone. They um, go through pregnancy where there's a huge change in their hormones. And then postmenopausal, it's often a little bit more like men. So looking at all that, the hormones markedly affect uh, the GI tract. And there are a large number of things that are only in women, like pregnancy, Um, and a number of things that are more common, like autoimmune diseases in women than men, gallstones in women as we get older, Um, autoimmune things, Um, endometriosis impacts the GI system. Other things like celiac disease is more common in women, Um, uh, pancreas, cysts, um, some of the cysts there, lupus, scleroderma, um, mast cell activation syndrome, a joint hypermobility that impacts the gut. So there are a huge number of things now that we're aware um, of being more common in women than men and a few more common in men. We do know, just look at the microbiome and a lot of the bacteria produce a lot of different things and they produce compounds and these are compounds that are fatty acids So type of fat, but small, and they're anti-inflammatory. So those are um, also affected by diet, the type of your microbiome. Um, They vary in different conditions. Uh, What you eat varies these things. And they vary, and diversity varies between men and women, how many different kinds of bacteria you have. And some of these bacteria secrete compounds that can go up to your brain for the gut-brain interaction, so that um, we're learning more and more about it. There are a lot of institutions, uh, universities, and a lot of people studying the microbiome, how it impacts us. And yes, we would love to have probiotics that direct (laughs) us at the healthy diet, but, um, and there's some studies out there, but a lot of the studies are not very good. It's very hard to get people to stick to a diet and do a good study um, for over a long term to see a result. So, 
fortunately and unfortunately, a lot of the data we have are in mice or other animals and not as many in people. So it sounds like you're not ready to make a recommendation to folks about taking a probiotic? I am not, except I will say there (laughs) are a couple good studies. And so there are a few studies with what we called irritable bowel syndrome, um, where uh, a bifidobacterium, is the type of bacterium, like in a line where they did the studies, and other bacteria and other probiotics um, that had a positive impact on uh, decreasing symptoms. There have been some studies with um, other probiotics and inflammatory bowel disease that contain different um, bacteria. Um, they've looked at a few other. Um, probiotics in different conditions. It would be ideal if we knew the right probiotic for the right person and the right microbiome that decreased inflammation, decreased our risk for cardiovascular disease, decreased our risk for diabetes. All of those things are really impacted by our gut microbiome. I remember when my kids were on antibiotics, uh, the pediatrician suggested a probiotic just to, you know, reestablish the flora. Is that something that you also prescribe? So I'm not sure how, you know, you're not going to totally reestablish your flora because you don't know what the flora is. And the probiotics only have a few bacteria. Mm -hmm. But there are other things you want to do, like prevent Clostridia difficile, which is a bacteria that can then cause colitis and diarrhea and um, all sorts of problems. And that from can the antibiotic from use. From the uh-huh. antibiotics. So often people use that. They also use uh, culturel. There are studies with that when you travel abroad to try to prevent traveler's diarrhea. Let's switch over. You talked about the gut brain Mm. axis, if you will, specifically as it pertains to irritable bowel syndrome. But let's take a step back and just talk about the relationship between the gut and the brain. So there, I'll, I'll even go back further. When women had complained of belly pain or belly pain related to their periods, They were not always believed by their physician. And I have to unfortunately admit that... That's an understatement. (laughs) That they're still not always. I've had people told it's all in their head. Yeah, or, you know, suck it up, right? (laughs) Or suck it up. You're a woman after all. Exactly, exactly. So I have... We're laughing, but it's sad. (laughs) I have to say when the men come into my office and have had a kidney stone, they say, now I know what labor's like. So, (laughs) but um, seriously, going back, it is a problem. And so there are a lot of immune cells uh, that secrete compounds that go right up the nerves into your brain and come back. With irritable bowel syndrome, it is uh, twice as common in women than men. So there are nerves that we have in our gut that also go up um, towards the spinal column and go up to the brain and then the brain secretes something and they come back down. These can be little compounds. They can be um, other 95% of serotonin, which makes you think well and is in your brain. If you're depressed, they try to activate it. That's in your gut. So why is 95% in your gut and only 5% in your brain? So the gut has a major impact on the brain. Interesting. For the sake of our listeners, talk a little bit about what irritable bowel syndrome is. What are some of the symptoms? So with irritable bowel syndrome, it's a abdominal pain. Um, It's a change in, in stools. Um, multiple days during the month. Um, 
it with uh, dis bloating or pain, and it's defined by the pain. You can have either a diarrhea or constipation, and the pain is often better after you have a bowel movement. At the moment, it's more of a clinical diagnosis. So we've ruled out if you have diarrhea, celiac disease, infection, inflammatory bowel disease. If you have constipation, we've ruled out any inflammation, blockage, or anything. So when you have these symptoms a number of days throughout the month, um, then irritable bowel syndrome or gut-brain disorders, and some people... You have the pain and we can't find anything. Some people, it's just constipation. You can't go. So these things um, are very common. Some people get just bloating anyway, and they don't get the change in stools or quite meet the diagnosis, but there are various things you can try, such as diet, uh, a, what we call a low FODMAP diet, it's uh, fructose, oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols. That's what it stands for. But at any rate, it's eliminating a lot of complex... <laughs> In English. <laughs> a lot of complex <laughs> carbohydrates. I have to always remember what it is. And eliminating things that cause bloating and gas, like lactose, fructose, sucrose, um, things like that. And there are a lot of good things online for looking at it and a lot of foods that are less likely to cause a problem. So it depends what the problem is. So let's just talk about gas. Um, first thing I try, I tell people, we'll try a lactose-free diet. Uh, a lot of people um, um, develop a lack, uh, inability to break down the sugar in milk products called the enzyme is lactase. It's breaking down lactose. So you see a lot of products out there that are lactose-free, lactase milk. They put it in. Yogurt has only a little bit of lactose in it. Some of the cheeses are better than other cheeses. So with that, if that's the problem, you can try using lactase like Dairy Ease or some other compound. If you're going to drink your milk or have your ice cream, you can uh, try the lactate-free milk or um, the lactate milk or whatever. Other things, if you have, you can also try other diets and eliminate the cruciferous vegetables. That does it. Some of the fruits do it, like Apples, which are my favorite this time of year, um, sure. can cause gas and bloating. So then you may need to avoid them. Beans. Beans cause gas in almost everybody, but there is an alpha-galactosidase. It's an enzyme in Beano where it can break down some of these sugars so you don't get as much gas. And a lot of people will take that during the time they're eating beans. The other thing is that I find is what if you have a lot of gas, bloating, what else might help? Um, cymethicone, which is in gas X, breaks down uh, the little bubbles to big bubbles to let you help get rid of it. Um, on the other hand, getting rid of gas at the inappropriate time is not the best thing if it smells bad or makes a lot of noise uh, or you can't hold it. Right. Um, another thing I often use is enteric coated peppermint capsules, things like IB Guard that release in your uh, small bowel, and that helps improve movement through the gut. But one warning is that it can cause acid reflux because it relaxes the high pressure zone between the esophagus and the stomach. So I, I won't I will tell people not to take that if um, they have a lot of reflux. But, you know, they used to hand out mints after dinner, and I think it was right. to allow people to burp so that you, you oh, can feel fantastic. better. That's sure. been my feeling about it. Um, sure. Other things, um, probiotics. There has been a study, as I mentioned earlier, uh, with a line which they advertise saying gastroenterologists approve if you see all the advertisements. Um, that was a study, maybe 60% versus 40% of controls got better, but it's not in everyone. 
And sure. if you have the constipation part, there are medications if increasing your fiber, um, adding fiber, Metamucil or Psyllium, Citrusyl, Benny fiber, flaxseed doesn't work. I'm making sure you drink a lot of water. Wait, flaxseed does not work? No, if it doesn't work, then you go oh, to something Oh, if it doesn't else. work, okay. I, I like okay. flaxseed. Yeah. Um, tablespoon of flaxseed, ground or whole or meal in the morning. Um, I think it's good. Benny fiber, which is uh, a dextrose, whatever works to bulk up your stool. Any of those things you can try. You need a lot of fiber. Up to 30 grams of fiber if you can do it with fluid uh, water. Now, do you count coffee and tea? I don't think so because coffee <laughs> and tea <laughs> make you pee. And yeah, if you <laughs> pee, you're not containing it in your gut. Right. But coffee so. also, also helps about 85% of people have bowel movements. It affects the colon and it stimulates the colon. So that's another oh, thing. That's interesting. Sure. And if you have diarrhea, you can do a little Imodium. You can, um, sometimes I find Fibercon helps. And there are other prescribed medications that can help all these things. One thing sure. I will say with constipation, though, there are two things. One is you don't get it down and bulk up. The other is you can't get it out. And not getting it out is pretty common in women Men can have it too, or you can leak out, and it's not appreciated by most doctors. Um, 20 years ago, we didn't really appreciate it at all, I would say. Hmm. And Probably because most people weren't talking about it, I would assume. Not talking about it, but I think also rectal exams in your doctor's office was just done to look for blood and not done to look for your function, and we weren't hmm. sending a lot of people for testing. But I will right. say we have pelvic floor therapists. They're fantastic and they can often help a lot as well as online uh, breathing exercises. And what are they helping? How do you know if you need that kind of help? So a lot of people will know they feel the stool comes down, but they can't get it out. They struggle, they strain, nothing happens. So when you think of function, what has to happen, the stool has to come down. And when you're having a bowel movement, your anus, that muscle at the very end, has to relax. Your pelvic floor has to straighten and the, it straightens out in the rectum. And you get, and it needs to drop a little bit. So you get pressure in the rectum and then you get relaxation so it comes out. If that anus, that muscle, stays really tight, nothing's going to get through it, right? You may hmm. leak. And so if you have a lot of stool left over, a little bit may leak out. And one, that's terribly embarrassing. Two, you feel uncomfortable. So if you can't get it out, it's, um, it's a good thing to be checked out. They, a good rectal exam can often tell if they're looking for function we have anal rectal motility tests where they put in a balloon and they measure out and see if you can get rid of it and how long it takes and at what, how big or small. And they measure the movement through there and what's happening. They're very good tests. And the final test, they can put barium up or a contrast and either do like you try to then get rid of it and they can look and see what's happening or they can do it with an MRI scan where they also look at your uterus and your bladder and see what's happening with that. What we're talking about for right now is constipation and potentially as it relates to irritable bowel syndrome. I have a couple of questions. One, very quickly, how often should you be pooping? <laughs> so they tell you what's the normal range, and right. some people have never <laughs> had that their whole life. So right, they exactly. claim the normal range is two per day to three per week. Two per day till three per week. Okay. In other words, 
14 per week or three per week. It okay. varies. So, uh, yes. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> I had to do that math. <laughs> uh, I have some people where it's only two per week, and it's been that way since they were a kid and they feel fine. So, why do anything about it, right? Uh, I have other people who have always their whole life had three per day. Uh, yes, but now the issue is <laughs> solid, liquid. Um, you know, probably need to put a disclaimer on this part in case the people are queasy, but please go on. <laughs> <laughs> right in the middle is pretty right. much where you want <laughs> want to be. Okay. Um, and I guess any change is obviously something that you want to be aware of as well. And which leads to my other question. What would you counsel people in terms of when to seek a, a physician and when to just say, this is probably normal. So one thing, if you bleed, if you have bleeding, that's that's a warning sign, right? If And if you're just bleeding a lot from your vagina, that's also a warning sign if there's something there. If you lose weight, um, you often want to get further help and see what's going on. If you have a lot of pain, you know, belly pain, and it's not just bloating, that's another thing. If you have bloating that never goes down and it's new, um, then it never hurts to see your physician. So severe weight gain, if you have a huge amount of weight gain, if your belly never goes down and it's hard, if... Um, you're having a huge amount of diarrhea, like if you were having six or eight a day, I mean, that needs to be worked up. If you can't get it out and you get these bad hemorrhoids and you're bleeding uh, or pain down there, you might think, oh, there's something wrong down there. Maybe I can get physical therapy to get it better. Mm -hmm. And that's another reason to go. Moving on, interestingly, colon cancer is the third most common cancer in both men and women. I don't know anyone who looks forward to a colonoscopy, um, but it seems like we either the incidence is increasing, but certainly the age at which it's occurring seems younger. And in fact, the guidelines were just recently changed from starting to screen at 50 um, to 45. So take us through what's going on and, and what your recommendations are. I would say, um, so screening decreases cancer risk, obviously, because you're picking up low things. Let's talk about an average risk person that doesn't have a family history of colon cancer. In the past, women's colon cancer lag behind men by eight years. In other words, if we were screening men at 50, shouldn't we screen women at 58 because their hormones protected them? So that's not really known. I do think you need it at 45 if it is no family history, so you're low risk, or uh, family history may be really remote, number one and not a lot of other cancers that are associated with colon cancer. If, yes. Such as? Such as breast, the BRAC gene, um, and there's some others uh, where there's a pancreas, a melanoma gene. If you have pancreas cancer, melanoma, can, um, and maybe breast cancer, or some of those, or ovarian cancer. The family histories where you see a lot of cancer may be also connected to colon cancer. And then the question is, well, if you have a lot of cancer in your family, do you want to get genetic testing? Um, that's always a very tricky question. Um, it's important for what kind of screening an individual get, but also what your family members might get? Should they start screening earlier? So we do recommend if there's colon cancer in the family to, or polyp, screen 10 years earlier to start. So if you had colon cancer in a, in a first degree relative at 50, you want to screen at 40, not 45. Um, and when you say screening, are you talking about the colonoscopy or are you talking about that cute little blue box? <laughs> uh -huh. 
<laughs> so if you have a risk, I would say a colonoscopy. The little blue box, which I assume you mean the DNA and everything yes. testing, which has been improving, is about 93% accurate and about 43, 45% accurate for big polyps, but you may miss the little polyps. In people who are predisposed or in young people, those may grow faster so that the next time you do that, you may have missed something that pre went in, got more uh, aggressive and went into a cancer from it. So if you have a family history, cancer, uh, colonoscopy. If you don't have a family history, now I again looked at recommendations and one group said, oh, you have to have a colonoscopy. Um, my feeling is screening is the best. Whatever test you do, it's better than nothing. The question becomes about your insurance coverage and it's a really big issue. How much is it gonna cost you? Um, can you afford it? Um, are you gonna get the screening because you say I can't afford it? Are you gonna get screening because you needed to go to your doctor? You can't afford to go to your doctor. You don't have a primary care doctor. Now you can't get it. So all these things, unfortunately, just impede our screening, just like you need to be screened for breast cancer, you need to get your pelvic exams done, um, you need to uh, get your screening for uh, colon cancer. A couple of other questions, uh, going back to some of the autoimmune issues, and this whole idea about gluten sensitivity. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned celiac, if you can explain what that is, which is on one end of the spectrum, if you will. And, you know, people that say uh, they've taken gluten out of their diet, they feel great, not necessarily having had any kind of testing and, and that kind of thing. So what are your thoughts on that? Celiac disease is a reaction you get to gluten, which is a protein in wheat and other grains. Um, and it is it causes damage to the bowel, the small bowel. There, it is based pretty much, most people have a specific genetic type. Um, there are two types that most people, 95% of people with celiac disease have, which is HLA, DQ2 or DQ8, just to, you don't need to remember that. <laughs> and we almost never check for it. Okay. But it's also associated with diabetes and other things, mm -hmm. other autoimmune diseases. So if we're going to check for celiac disease, the villi are usually very tall and you absorb things on them. But in celiac disease, it damages them. They get shorter. They're really sort of stubby. And, and that's you, in the lining of the, of the bowel. Of the bowel, about. in uh -huh. the small intestines. Mm -hmm. And then you get under it a lot of inflammatory cells. So that is an autoimmune thing. Um, can cause low iron, low B12, low vitamin D, constipation, diarrhea. Um, and so, and a lot of symptoms. So... We look at the blood to check for antibodies. Easy test as long as you aren't deficient in some of the antibodies. And then we'll do a biopsy of the small bowel uh, with an endoscopy um, to, make, to see if you have celiac disease, number one. So some people don't have that, but gluten bothers them. There is a wheat allergy, which I don't think is that common, but it's actually like an allergy to anything, like uh, the pollen that's coming down right now. <laughs> and then you have people, they eat gluten, they bloat, they get maybe a uh, foggy brain, they get changes in their bowels. Well, some of it may be irritable bowel syndrome because some people find gluten yet they eliminate gluten, that helps. And other people have this sensitivity, and we don't really know what it is. I will put it that way. Some of those people may have the gene that I just mentioned. 
some of those people may be a, a relative of the other people. Maybe they were sensitized when they were young, and um, I don't totally know, and, and people are still looking into sensitivity. I know that this is a one-off, but my daughter, when she was young, had a corn, a true corn allergy. She couldn't be gluten-free for the most part because a lot of the gluten-free products have mm -hmm. corn in them. So, which leads me to my other question, if you can just talk briefly about the idea of food allergies and sensitivities. And that is a really challenging one. So meat, red meat, and the fats in red meat, um, processed foods, um, where they have additives in foods, all of those things seem to be inflammatory. Regarding what is anti-inflammatory, well, uh, fish, uh, the Mediterranean diet, there's a Nordic diet. Um, when I reviewed this, I said the ketogenic diet, but I'm really not, don't understand in comparison to the others. But it's a lot of fruit, vegetables, because they stimulate the bacteria that they secrete these anti-inflammatory compounds. And uh, they get, and they release more, so it's more anti-inflammatory, which may be why the Mediterranean diet has less cardiovascular disease in that. One thing, um, obesity has increased, and yeah. severe obesity is greater in women than in men. And with obesity, you get more fat in your liver, um, you get... Um, obviously more heart disease and other things. And so do you want to just say just a couple of words about that connection uh, with respect to, because you alluded to it in terms of uh, probiotics or the, the gut microbiome increasing serotonin, um, which is, you know, what a lot of uh, antidepressants do. And so just the effect of food on uh, the gut and the brain. So again, um, an anti-inflammatory diet causes you to get these bacteria that grow and um, they release these fatty acids that can go up to the brain and get up there and cause uh, release of other compounds and they're, um, or they release um, these small compounds that affect the, the brain and just go up. Uh, to the brain uh, via the nerves, via the um, the, the the vasculature, etc. And they um, and if you look at people complain of uh, what do I want to call it confusion, uh, like brain fog, brain fog. A lot of people say, well, that's wheat, it's something I ate, I get it with that. And that has to be a specific release of compounds from your bacteria. Um, hmm. I think that either, I think they are doing a lot of research with this in the air here in Boston where I am, looking at those compounds being released and what can we do to... Uh, get the right bacteria into the gut. I'm not sure that we have that. I will say one thing I never mentioned, but there's this inflammatory cell called the mast cell. Everyone mm -hmm. talks about it now, right? Mast cell activation, mast cell disease. It's involved in endometriosis. It's involved in irritable bowel. It's involved in Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. And it it's, which is that hyperflexibility which is disease the hy that you were talking about. The joint hypermobility. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. this cell causes a lot of issues and inflammation and may be very responsible for which way our body goes on getting inflammatory response. And we don't really know the full connection between this at all, but if you look at it, it's in all of those things and people are trying to evaluate that. And to that point... You know, and you had mentioned you mentioned the connection with endometriosis and irritable bowel, and now you said that there may be a link with respect, or at least commonality in terms of this mast cell. If someone comes to you that has both of those, and obviously they've probably been to their primary care doctor or their OBGYN to talk about the endometriosis, how do you approach that, or, and what suggestions do you make from a, a GI standpoint? 
Well, let me say that it's often four to six years for diagnosis for endometriosis. Yes. And if you look yes. at the British study, it was six years. So if they go, people go to their primary care doctor, it may be totally missed, number one. Number right. two, regarding endometriosis, often if you get that uh, under control, the IBS gets better. But not everybody specifically treats that. Um, I, I think even in uh, OBGYN, um, most people who get it, and I have had people where I've been shockingly surprised they've had endometriosis, um, but if you treat that, it often helps the IBS. If you treat the IBS, what you need to do, it doesn't really help the endometriosis. So, um, the, I send people or discuss it with their GYN people. Often, if I think they have IBS and pain in one area or bleeding, I might get, um, most places will do an intravaginal ultrasound um, or, an, or an, an abdominal ultrasound looking for endometriosis and where it is. Here, I think our MRI is a little more sensitive, so I might get an MRI of the pelvis looking for implants on the bowel. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. I have seen that. I've actually seen them in the bowel, which is mm -hmm. rare. Uh, lately, we saw them in the stomach. Um, and it's reported elsewhere. So endometriosis can be anywhere, but you need to treat both. And I would go to OBGYN to discuss whether you start with medicine, whether they feel you need a laparoscopy to make a diagnosis or to get rid of the endometriosis or whatever. And in a young person, if they're thinking of pregnancy, they really need to go discuss it with OBGYN because there's a high rate of infertility and endometriosis. What did I not ask you that you wanted to make sure that uh, we covered? So one thing I want to be sure is um, pregnancy. And pregnancy, you know, uh, even if you're older now, you may have uh, a daughter or even a daughter-in-law who's going to get pregnant. And there are a right. lot of conditions in pregnancy that affect women, the GI condition. Nausea and vomiting, I would bet you most <laughs> people, maybe you, 85% of people have it. And um, there are different foods different people can eat uh, that is better for them. Uh, heartburn. That's what I had. Heartburn <laughs> in about 85% of people. And it's evenly divided between the three uh, trimesters. But what's remarkable is, and I think this is what we need to then get an idea for everyone else. When a woman delivers, I have found that if when the placenta is delivered, the heartburn goes away. It's remarkable, okay? That's in people have had it only related to pregnancy, but almost everyone it's related to the placenta. So hmm. what? So some people are looking at what's in the placenta that's affecting the heartburn and what impact will that have for the rest of us, right? I sure. think we can learn a tremendous amount by why do men not get this? What's the difference? What's the estrogen doing? If you get it and it goes away, oh, that's fantastic. Um, so I think that is really key to what's going on. And um, in, in pregnancy is important. What's the safety of drugs? What, um, what's the level of drugs yes. in pregnancy? They change. Can we lower them? Do we need to raise them? So did you look at both sexes? Did you just do one sex? I think we have so much to learn in this area. So much to learn from the men related to the women and the women related to the men and hormones. I think that's a key point on what we need to do and what we need to learn. I couldn't agree more. And as and my last question to you would be, if you could suggest maybe one or even two action items that our listeners can take right now to make themselves uh, or help themselves be healthier, what would those be? One 
increase your fiber and fluid in your diet, which will help your bowels. Two, get your cancer screening and make sure you're up to date. Um, three, if you have GI symptoms like bloating or whatever, then look at your food. And if you get a specific symptom one night after you go out to eat, then it happens another night when you go out to eat. Write down everything you ate and then try to figure out a specific thing. Um, and I think getting exercise, we didn't mention it. Exercise is key. You read my mind. I was going to ask that. It's yes. key. It helps uh, stimulate the metabolism. It um, If you go out and do a lot of exercise and never did it, realize you're going to gain weight. Muscle weighs more than adipose fat, uh, tissue or fat, um, and you want to be healthier, and that that is uh, much healthier. Those are the things that, and eat a healthy diet is what I would say. Dr. Jacqueline Wolf, thank you so much for these great insights. I know I learned a lot, and I really appreciate the time you've taken to be with us. You're welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Well, it's been an enlightening session discussing the complex world of women's GI health with Dr. Jacqueline Wolf. So let's summarize the key points, including some solutions, and touch on specific issues like endometriosis and colon cancer. We learned that women disproportionately suffer from conditions like irritable bowel syndrome, inflammatory bowel disease, and celiac disease, and how these can significantly affect our lives. Hormonal changes, such as those during menstrual cycles, pregnancy, and menopause impact on GI symptoms, so understanding this connection is vital for proper treatment and management. We also talked about the tendency to overlook or misdiagnose women's GI symptoms. If someone says it's all in your head, now you can tell them it could be connected to my gut. If you're having symptoms of bleeding, bloating, constipation, or diarrhea, those should be addressed. Dr. Wolf emphasized the importance of a balanced anti-inflammatory diet, rich in fiber, the potential benefits of probiotics, and the positive impact of regular exercise on GI health. And as I mentioned, there is a direct link to the nervous system and the gut, so we do need to take that into consideration for effective treatment. Endometriosis, often misdiagnosed or overlooked, can significantly impact GI health, and many times the two overlap. It's important to recognize those symptoms and seek specialized care. And finally, colon cancer is the third most common cancer in women, and we discuss the importance of screening. Regular screenings based on age, medical history, and family history are key preventive measures. So in wrapping up, Remember that understanding your body and being proactive in seeking health care is crucial. It's essential to consult with health care providers for personalized advice, especially for conditions like endometriosis and colon cancer, where early detection and treatment can make a significant difference. And if you aren't getting the response you need, be persistent. I thank you for joining us, and I hope you're leaving today's episode feeling more informed and empowered about your health. I invite you to take a look at our website at beyondthepapergown.com, where we also have articles, information on events, and how you can take action to make a difference in women's health, whether through political advocacy or supporting nonprofit service organizations. We even have a marketplace with special discounts for BTPG listeners. And while you're there, subscribe to our newsletter so you're up to date on our podcast and other offerings, as well as women's health news. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube. Please leave us a comment when you drop by. And if you would, before you go, please rate us on your podcast platform. It helps us get noticed. Until next time, take good care. This podcast was produced by Patrick Shambayati and me, and Kyla McMillian is our associate producer.